Um, turn to Acts chapter 15. We're going to leave off, uh, pick up where we left off last week in verse 36, where Paul starts his second missionary journey. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. I'll give y'all just a minute to turn there. As most of you know, I always teach out the NIV version. It's just good for me to do. So, hope y'all enjoy it as well. Acts chapter 15, verse 36. This is the start of Paul's missionary journey. He has finished his first one, returned to Antioch of Syria, and he uh, talks to Barnabas. He said, Barnabas, let's go back to all the places we went first, check on them, encourage them, and uh, see how things are going. But that's just what they're going to do here. But let's see what happens. Verse 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in uh, Pamphylia and had not continued to with them in the work. We'll stop right there. Back in chapter 13, verse 13, we see where Mark had went with them on their first missionary journey, but hadn't been very far, been through a few towns, he decided to turn around and go back to Jerusalem. Now, Mark was a young Christian, just getting started in this missionary stuff, and it does not tell us why he bailed out and went to Jerusalem, but Paul did not like the idea of it whatsoever. Now, Paul does not hold a grudge against Mark forever because we know in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 11, we find Paul writing a letter to Timothy and he's telling him that uh, everybody is deserting him to bring him this. He also says, bring Mark with you because he is helpful to my ministry. Bring Mark with you. So something happened between this event and when Paul was writing to Timothy while he was in prison, that uh, convinced Paul that Timothy was a good missionary and was good for his ministry. Now, they have a disagreement here. Let's look and see what it said. And also keep in mind that John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, the text forces us to ask who was wrong, who was right here. Let's ask the question first, who was right about this disagreement? It said it was a sharp disagreement. In other words, it was... Sharp enough to split two friends up, two fellow missionary journeys that already traveled together, spent a lot of nights together, uh, preached together in a lot of synagogues and a lot of uh, sermons on the streets, uh, had been through the first missionary journey together. But Barnabas wanted to take Mark with him. Uh, that was his cousin. Obvious reasons why he wanted to take him. First of all, that he's getting to him. Secondly, Barnabas wanted to give um, Mark another chance. We know that Barnabas, way back in the book of Acts, it tells us that he's dubbed the name Son of Encouragement. Barnabas was known for encouraging people. So for obvious reasons, he wanted to take Mark. Uh, he he, he um, uh, wanted to encourage him to continue on in the missionary work and strengthen him through that. But Paul did not like the idea whatsoever, so they had a sharp disagreement. Now, how does that affect us today, or what does that mean for us today? First of all, you got to ask who was right here, Paul or Barnabas? Paul. I think Barnabas and Paul both was right. I was going to say, why well, can't both? Yeah, both. Oh, all that was so you're right, Mr. Paul was right. Also, Barnabas was right. Well, it just says in here that um, they were commended by the brethren to the grace and the favor and mercy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Paul and Silas, I didn't see that on the other, and that's why I said that. But you're right. Paul was right. I think Barnabas was right, too. 
Now, disagreements, first of all, you've got to understand that uh, believers will disagree. It happens in the church. Believers will disagree. It's how you look at the disagreement that matters. Now, Brother Ken and I, we love each other to pieces. We actually went to lunch yesterday together, had a good lunch, had a good time together, went and bought a computer. But Brother Ken and I don't always agree on things, and he'll be the first to tell you that. But it's healthy for us to agree to disagree. Because what that does is when Ken and I don't agree on things, it forces us to look at each, each other's side of the conversation. Whatever we're talking, whatever we're disagreeing on, we look at each other's side of that, we pray about it, and at the end of the day, we still love each other. You got to understand that disagreements will happen in the church. Secondly, you have to check your attitude. If you get in a disagreement with somebody in the church, the first thing to do is check your attitude. Now, I have to, I've had to pray about that because my attitude can often get bad. I'll admit that. Amen. Secondly, you have to understand the dynamics of the disagreement. You have to understand what's causing this disagreement. What are the dynamics of the disagreement? Thirdly, you have to respond appropriately. Respond appropriately to the disagreement. And then seek forgiveness when necessary. And as a last resort, separation. Separation. One leaving the church and one staying or both leaving the church. Here what happened is Paul and Barnabas Disagree sharply. That's a strong word to find in the Bible. A strong disagreement. This, this disagreement was so strong that it caused them to split ways. you got to ask yourselves, is the Holy Spirit at work here in, in this disagreement? Yes, He is at work. Very much so. Because what happened here is this disagreement, although it might have looked bad on paper, it did a world of good for the spreading of the gospel. The gospel, instead of going one way, it spreads two ways. Uh, Barnabas and, and Mark go to Cyprus, which is uh, where Barnabas was raised. He had property in Cyprus. Remember back when they were selling their land possessions and laying at the apostles' feet? Barnabas sold a piece of land in Cyprus and gave it to the apostles to distribute to those in need. So Barnabas was familiar with Cyprus, and that's where he took Mark. So him and Mark sailed that way, and uh, uh, Barnab uh, Paul and Silas sail another way. Now, a little bit about Silas. What we learn about Silas in Scripture is, first of all, he's a leader in the Jerusalem church. Uh, he represented the church by assisting Paul and Barnabas in the carrying of the letter back to Antioch. Remember when the, uh, the, the thing come up about the Gentile believers, uh, the Jews had put these restrictions on them, they had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses, and the council had a meeting about it and decided no, they do not have to be circumcised, they do not have to become Jews before they can become believers, and they do not have to follow, follow the law of Moses. They only put a few restrictions on them, restrained from food sacrificed to idols, Restrained from blood and sexual immorality. Three things, and strangle, uh, and not to eat from strangled animals, or in other words, that's the blood, because the Jews believe in, you know, bleeding out the meat. So if it's strangled, it's not bled out. So that uh, the blood thing all falls in that category. So that's the only agree, uh, stipulations they put on the Gentile. Uh, Silas was one that went back with Paul to Antioch to take this letter from the council to uh, the Gentile believers in Antioch to tell them, no, you don't have to do all this stuff that they're, this yoke that they're putting on you that they can't even put on yourself. So. And also, Silas worked as a writing secretary for both Paul and Peter. So in other words, he recorded a lot of stuff for them. So we find out that about Silas. So Paul felt it worthy to take Silas with him. In verse 42, it says, when they went on through Syria, so let's you know, straighten in the churches. So let's move on. Uh, you know, I think it, you can assume that Paul and Barnabas and uh, John Mark had quite different personalities and approaches, and 
uh, especially one of them being a uh, Maybe the church is going to be a lot public stronger if we celebrate our diversity rather than expecting uniformity. Mm -hmm. The church is going to and they think everybody has to think like a cookie cutter. Everybody has to think the same. But diversity, uh, like being playing a different instrument in the orchestra. And um, a church would celebrate that. I, I, I've involved in the Minister Alliance for the president and trying to get black churches involved with different things we did. Preach a lot of black churches, had a black preacher, preacher of Bible, and our church did a great job. But uh, I think we all need to celebrate the fact that we're different and unique. And I thank God that uh, we're all not like me. We had lunch together Sunday, but we're a lot different. I think we just need to get to that place where we are grateful. That's true. Can somebody open those two doors in the back? That's in that cool area. It's getting hot in here. When the air is working, it just ain't keeping up and it's not here. Except where I'm sitting. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's so can I trade places with it? You can back up about five, back up about four feet. <laughs> as long as it's quiet in the nursery, we can leave those back, back up a little bit. Back up about four feet. That pen over the hill out there. Okay, Let's look at chapter 16. Chapter 16. When I get hot like that, my voice goes out. Chapter 16. Paul came to Derby, then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy, who lived with his mother, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. A little bit about Timothy. We know from 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 Timothy 3, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, verses 3 through 5, we hear a little bit about Timothy about his mother and his grandmother. Chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'll turn it around, wait, hang on a second. Verses 3 through 5. Okay. Alright, here we go. Actually, I'm, I'm said it wrong, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy. Chapter 1, 2 Timothy. All right, 3 through 5. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you. Now this is Paul writing letters to Timothy. I long to see why he is in a Roman prison. This is some of the last writings that we get from Paul right here. So that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. So we live here a little bit about Timothy there. He's a young believer. His grandmother and his mother are Jews. Uh, they are both believers, Lois and Eunice. It talks about them here, but it don't give their names. But over in, in 2 Timothy, it gave us their names. So we hear a little bit about Timothy there. He's a, uh, a strong Christian who will later become a great pastor. We're going to learn about that a little later. A uh, great pastor and great leader in the church. Uh, he was mentored under Paul. Now, what I want to say about Timothy, Barnabas, and Paul is, first of all, everybody needs to be a Paul. All of us need to be a Paul. We all need to be on fire for the Lord, ready to go and spread the gospel message, just as Paul was. But we also need to have a Barnabas in our life. We need to have someone in our life that encourages us along the way. We also need to have a Timothy in our life, someone that we mentor to, someone that we bring along with us and raise them up in the faith. That's biblical. We see it here. And we need to in some way, somehow, try to apply that to our lives. Find you somebody that's young in the faith and mentor to them. Uh, help, help them along in the faith. Uh, find you somebody that encourages you. 
And uh, when you get the feeling like you're ready to give up, this person will step in and, and lift you up and uh, help carry you along the way. Verse 2, the believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. So now we see the third person joining Paul's team, Timothy. He's already got Silas, now he's picking up Timothy. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now, why did Paul circumcise Timothy after they just took a letter back to Antioch, Syria, saying that the Gentile believers would not have to be circumcised? Uh, Timothy would have been half Jewish and half uh, Greek. So he would have been kind of like a Samaritan type. So why do you figure that Paul felt the need to circumcise him? Well, you see them Jews, I imagine. Pardon? Paul said, I'm all things to all people, or whatever it's impossible. So he so wouldn't be a stumbling block to the Jews. Yeah. To the Jews. Yeah, over in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verse 3, <coughs> it says, Paul says this, to the Jews I became like a Jew, to win them. <coughs> to those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not. So as to win those under the law. To those having the law, I became not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. As to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. What he's saying here, whoever you're witnessing to, become like them. Now, I'm not saying if you're witnessing to an unbeliever, become an unbeliever. I'm saying you have to get yourself on their level. Find common ground in between you and them. And that's just what Paul said. You know, to the Jews, I become like a Jew. To the weak, I become weak. As not to be a stumbling block. You don't want to put yourself, uh, when you're witnessing to unbelievers, don't put yourself on this high pedestal like you're almighty and righteous because you're saved. Um, stay humble. Stay humble. Become like the people you're witnessing to. Um, if you're down at the well witnessing, don't go down there in a three-piece suit, all dressed up with a tie. Just put on some regular clothes to go witness to homeless people. Don't put yourself up on a pedestal. And that's just what Paul did here with Timothy. He, uh, he circumcised him, asked to not make him a stumbling block to the Jews. Because where did Paul go in every town, almost every town, some of them didn't have them, but where is the first place he always went? Synagogue. Synagogue. Always went to the synagogue first. Who's in the synagogues? Jews. 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 Jewish uh, people following, uh, practicing Judaism. So, as they traveled from town to town, verse 4, they delivered decisions reached by all reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem. That was the decisions we just talked about. For the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. I love that part about growing daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Pyrrha, Pyrrha, and the Galatia. Having been... Let me stop there a minute. What do I say almost every week I'm going to hear about the Holy Spirit? If you tune in to the Holy Spirit, He can do what in your daily life? Miracles. No, He can do what? He guide you. Guide you. Thank you, Bill. He can lead you and He can guide you every day of your life. So listen to this. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, when they came to the border of Mesia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Wow. The Spirit here is guiding Paul, Timothy, and Silas everywhere they go. He just stopped them from going two places. 
It does not tell us how the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It could have been through prophets, you know, the prophets of the day. It could have been through, it even could have been through an audible, audible voice. Uh, Paul had already experienced that audible voice on the road to Damascus. Could have been in a number of ways that the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It does not tell us. The main thing it tells us is they were led and they were guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit closed some doors and He opened some doors. And what that tells me is sometimes God's no's are just as important as God's yeses. Unclosed doors or closed doors are just as important as unclosed doors. Let's see why the Holy Spirit stopped them from going in those two directions. It's a very, very good reason. So, let's see, where was I at? During the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we, hold on, who's the writer of Acts? Luke. Luke. He's been saying they, they, them. What happens here? We. We. What does that tell you? Luke's what? He joined us. He joined So now the party's grown to forward. Luke is with it. That's another reason why I have the Holy Spirit might have spoke. Uh, Luke is a what? Physician. What's his profession? Doctor. A Gentile doctor. Sickness could have stopped him from going to these two areas. For some reason, Luke joined the group right here. And he's a doctor. It's the first time we see this in this book uh, where it says we say. Verse 10 is where we get Luke joining up. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is a 50 point bonus question, if you get it right. And it all spurs back to chapter 1, verse 9, where it says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. From them, from them not going to these other two places and they end up in Macedonia, what does that do for the spread of the gospel? Increases, the points that you get it right. Increases the spread of the gospel. Where does it take it to that had to be in there? What area? Near Greece. Macedonia. European. Europe. Europe. Yeah. It takes the gospel to Europe. So... Instead of them going to Roman provinces and cities and towns, they ended up in Europe because the Holy Spirit blocked them and sent them to Europe. Now we got the gospel in Europe, which is so cool the way the Holy Spirit works. From Troas, we put out the sea and sailed through straight for us. I, I can't pronounce all these names. Samatras. And the next day we went to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony. And leading city in the district of Macedonia, and there, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate of the river to where we accepted to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who would, women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Tyre Tyre named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. Um, what Lydia was was a a worshiper of God or a worship of, worshiper of uh, the God of Judaism. <coughs> she had not yet heard the gospel, but she's about to. Now, also, what it tells us about Lydia, as a dealer in purple cloth, she would be a successful businesswoman. Um, she'd be kind of wealthy as well. So she's, uh, let's see what it says about her. A dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The, the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. So, in other words, Lydia responded to Paul's gospel message. She got saved. Uh, her household heard the message. They got saved. When she 
Christian, the members of her house baptized. She invited us to her home. So there's another thing that she provided uh, was uh, housing for Paul and his team. We know his team now is uh, him plus three. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, <clears throat> come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once when we were going to the place of prayer. Oh, let me back up a bit. <clears throat> Paul is going to in Philippi now. What do you see that he didn't do in Philippi? He didn't go to the synagogue. He didn't go to a synagogue. Why? Well, he wasn't there. Well, he wasn't there. Well, he wasn't there. <laughs> Remember the, remember the law about a synagogue? You had to have ten Jewish men or more to start a synagogue. So Philippi was primarily a Gentile uh, city. There must have not have been ten Jewish men there because there was not a synagogue there. But there was women worshiping down by the river. I meant to look this up, but there's uh, somewhere in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, there's... Uh, Something about worshiping by living water. In other words, uh, you're not supposed to worship by, uh, what's, how does that go? Uh, stale water, but you can worship by living water. In other words, the water had to be running. So that's what, being there you know, wasn't a synagogue there, and I'll look that up, and we'll talk about it next week. The women would have went down and worshiped by the living water, the, the running water. But that's what they were doing down on the bank. True as we put out to sea and sail through. Oh, I've been back to too, too far. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money from her owners by fortune telling. Now, let me tell you this about this girl. She was not able to predict the future by the power of the Holy Spirit. She was able to predict the future by a demon, a, a Satan, uh, Satan demon, Satan, she was a Satan worshiper, had a demon inside of her, it was satanic, and that's how she was able to predict the future and uh, do fortune telling. That makes you understand why Paul did what he did next. <clears throat> she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High of God who are telling you the way to be saved. That's very accurate. What she was saying was very accurate. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so anointed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. And if I hadn't told you what I told you about uh, Satan, the satanic demon being in her, you would say, you wonder why he did that. He had free advertising. She was just following around telling everybody that these men were telling you how to be saved, service of the Most High. But Paul called the Spirit out of her because he did not want Satan getting any sort of credit of any kind. Heck with the free advertisement, he thought. I will do away with this demon, and she will no longer follow her behind me, giving Satan credit for spreading the gospel message. See, Satan knows the gospel message. He, know, he knows about Jesus. He tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross. He knows all about it. When the owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged him to the marketplace to face authorities. So she was owned by probably some shady people who uh, used her uh, just like a pimp would use a prostitute to make them money. She was under complete control of Satan, under ownership of the shady people, and by her being a fortune teller, she would get paid for that, or the men would get paid for that, and that was actually their income. Can you imagine their thoughts when they figured out that the satanic demon had been uh, fled from her and fled from her because Paul called him out, called the demon out? I bet they were mad, or their income had just come to a stop. 
They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating the customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. Can you imagine somebody saying, These people are from Emmanuel and they're turning our city upside down with their gospel message. That's what we want to hear somebody say, isn't it? The crowd <coughs> joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrate ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they were severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Y'all ever heard of corporal punishment? That's what's happening right here. The beating punishment by beating. Did you know modern day Singapore still enforces corporal punishment? Back in the 90s, there was a 19-year-old boy who got called over there for vandalism, and they ordered him to serve six months in jail and six strikes with the rod, which the sentence was reduced down to four months in jail and four strikes with the rod. No senators could do anything about it. No, no, no. <laughs> but in Singapore, you don't see gum on the litter on the streets. Right. You don't see people going around cussing. You don't see nasty commercials uh, on television. You don't see uh, cursing in movies on television. You don't see none of that stuff. Because all that stuff is punishable. You get caught throwing a piece of gum on the ground in Singapore, you could get beat with a rod. More countries need to be like Singapore. <laughs> I'm serious. They're a kingdom, they was that a you don't have all this uh, thieving going on, robberies and breaking in and stuff like that in Singapore because they have strict laws. Larry King had a group of Singaporean teenagers about seven or eight and brought up the subject of premarital sex and they, they were like, what's that? It never happens. That's right. You don't have all that. Yeah. That's right. You don't. Hold over culture. You don't have all that in Singapore. And my opinion, that's a good thing. Nobody had enough pull to get that, prevent that boy from getting his strikes. No, he sure didn't. He had to take the punishment. And no. Um, he vandalized about 50 cars. He deserved it. Yeah, he, he deserved it. it. Yes, he did. He they had warned him. But anyway, I just wanted to bring that up uh, about corporal punishment. Of course, we don't have that in America. That's why our country, for one, that's one of the many reasons why our country is what it is. It's called we're just not straight enough. Did you know now that I think it's for shoplifting? If you get caught with less than nine hundred dollars worth of stuff, they don't do anything about it anymore. You just got it, California. Well, my uh, son-in-law's mother told us two days ago that uh, people are coming into Walmart and even Kroger and they're just carrying things out and the cashier told them, they said that they were told us, let them be carrying off flat screen TVs from Waycross. Mm -hmm. And the cashier was instructed, don't stop it. I mean, that's- That's in Waycross? Yeah, mm -hmm. unbelievable. Uh, so anyway, that's unbelievable that it would happen here. Wow. Well, that's good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, John, let's go to the Okay. Let's go to Yeah. What do you mean for the still running? <laughs> Ken and I were just talking about putting a flat screen on our credit card at Sam yesterday. We don't yeah. have to do that. How much is that? How much is that? I know it. I'm going to keep going forward. I know it. You're going to stop you. They would. And ask you if you need help as they carry you back in the chair. Yeah. All right, y'all. Let's go. Verse 24. When he received the orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, all the saws were praying and singing. The wow. They just got beaten by rods, thrown in prison, fastened with stocks. Put yourself in this place. What would you be doing? Would you be. You know they had to be hurt. Rod beats are no, no joke, you know. 
That's serious stuff. Well, now, now we know why Mark was in a different direction. <laughs> that first time. And he didn't want to get beat like Paul did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but everywhere Paul went, he got himself in trouble for preaching the gospel. Yeah, what would we be doing if we got him? If that happened to us, if we were sitting in the prison. I'd be crying somewhere, thinking there's no way out. Oh my God. God, 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 God. But it says here that Paul and Silas were praying and singing him. Singing. Singing. Right. Yeah. Maybe Chris would be the only one singing the prison. <laughs> That's why the stocks fell off. Singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Why was he about to kill himself? Or the first he knew what he was doing anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What's his punishment? Yeah. If he, what is his punishment if the prisoners escape on his death? Yeah. Yeah. Remember back, remember back when the, uh, this, the the angel led Peter out of prison, and then remember I told you there were sixteen guards that had on different shifts guarding him. All sixteen of them got whacked. Yeah. So let's see what happens here. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, "Don't harm yourself. We're all here." They did not leave. Doors were open, the chains come loose, and I'm sure under Paul's instruction, all the prisoners were told to stay put. Just stay put where you're at. Don't, don't get up and leave. You know, when the guards were killed for letting a prisoner escape, that was also a, a poverty sentence for the family. That means they were going to die of poverty. Mm -hmm. right. That's right. They lose their source of income. The jailer caught the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? There's your reason for Paul and Silas and the prisoners not running away. Salvation is brought to the prison. They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Now we're going to talk a little bit about this verse. Because it's been misinterpreted, misused over the years. Well, first of all, I want you to look at the stipulations. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. He did not say, believe in the Lord Jesus, don't dare go dancing, don't wear any jewelry, don't get any tattoos, make sure you take communion every day. Uh, what else? Uh, don't cut your hair. Don't cut, yeah, get, make sure you get submerged under water. He did not add anything to believe in the Lord Jesus. That's all it takes. Believe in the Lord Jesus. All these other things that we love to tag onto our salvation to make us think that we did something ourselves to get to heaven are just ridiculous. Amen. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's all it takes. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Of course, we, we like to get baptized afterwards. That's just a byproduct of salvation. After you believe in the Lord Jesus and get saved, you want to get baptized because you want to tell the public, yes, I was saved by shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then you want to keep the law to a certain extent, except for speaking. And you want to do good things. <laughs> I, I just heard that. <laughs> you want to go to Saturday service and you want to do this and you want to do that but none of that gets you to heaven folks believe in the Lord Jesus there's your sermon but it's, but we need to dig a little bit deeper. you can dig uh, the, the word believe is not just a mind right. knowledge but it is also a heart commitment right. Right. Uh, I mean you can't just say oh I believe in God or I believe in Jesus and it's knowledge uh I think that salvation comes when you pour your heart into it and give your life to Jesus. It is a commitment. It literally, it literally means you're going down the road one way and you make a complete turn and go the other way. It's not crazy. You can fast to be a Christian and not have Christ in your life. 
Amen. The demons. Profession is not always no. possession. I say it all the time. You're, I'm glad you brought that up, kid, because you're so right. It is a total heart change, a total heart commitment, a total giving every area of your life over to Jesus. But this part about you will be saved, you and your household. Now, this verse has been misused uh, uh, ways like you can get to heaven and hang it on to your grandma's church, church tail, stuff like that. Folks, the reason he said about his household getting saved is this jailer's salvation did not get his household saved. It was their personal commitment to Christ that got them saved. Paul could have had a prophetic vision at the time where he could see ahead to see that the household would accept Jesus Christ or something there he, that he, he believed that the household would accept. Something happened there with Paul that these words were put down in his writing. But that doesn't mean that his household held on to the jailer's shirt tail and that's their way to heaven. Every person has to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. A personal, not a relationship with somebody else. It's personal. One-on-one, -on -one, you and Jesus Christ. But don't ever let that verse throw you off balance and think that if you get saved, automatically your household gets, uh, is saved as well. But I got members of my household that aren't saved. You know, they're not going to heaven on my shirt bill. It's, it takes them in that personal commitment. All right, we're going to end up right there until next week. But we're going to um, move along next week and <clears throat> see Paul go a little bit further and further on into Athens. Athens is a great place to study, a great place to um, look at and talk about. Was the household the people at the prison room that heard all this? I think it was the jailer's yeah. family. Oh, the family? Yeah. Or was the household where the jailer was? And they went home. And sure, because well, of course they yeah. You'll see in just a few more verses that they were, okay. they were released. Okay. And, went on, yeah. and you know what? You brought up a good point. You brought up a good point because some of the prisoners could have got saved as well. It just don't tell us that. Alright, let's pray and, and get on out of this hot room. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time we're studying your word. We thank you for your spirit, your great Holy Spirit, and we can guide us every day as scripture uh, shows us. Help us, Father, each one of us to tap into that spirit each and every day of our life and to be the witnesses that you created us to be. Keep us safe as we leave this place. Uh, equip us and enable us to go out and spread your gospel message in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.